Dear family in Christ, God is indeed merciful and kind, full of, full of mercy each day. Please join me in prayer as we now come to him. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, I give thanks to you for sending us your Son, Christ Jesus. In your greatest act of mercy of all, sending him to, to humble himself, to dwell among us, to give us eternal life. Help us each day to trust in him, to trust in his sacrifice, to know our salvation is sure. Lord, may we each day humble ourselves before you, but know that, you, that we can boast in your name. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if you realize this or not, but Genesis 14 marks a first. It actually marks the first war that is recorded in Scripture. Genesis, and admittedly, there have been other disputes. There have been even murders before this, Cain and Abel being the first one. But this is the first actual war that is recorded in Scripture. Genesis 14 refer, re records the war not between God's people and more of God's people, but actually between Gentiles. It's interesting because the only reason that Abram, notice he's not Abraham yet, gets involved is not because he has an interest in the war itself, but because of his family ties. Now when you think about it, a lot of people go to war for different reasons, don't they? Family can be one of those reasons. War can be fought over because of land. War can be fought over because of oil. War can be fought over because of honor, because of pride. But here today, we see how much family was important to Abram. He enters into this war because of his nephew Lot. Now, it doesn't tell us, Scripture doesn't tell us if the reason he entered into this war was because he felt like he had to or because he loved his nephew so much or, he, or there was a sense of duty, but all we do know is that he, went in, that he entered this war. And not only did he enter the war, but I love the Hebrew word here, and I, I think that the ESV weakens it too much, but he went in and he brought 318 trained men and he nakad his enemy. And you guys don't have to say nakah with me there, but when you hear that word nakah, it means he routed them. He went in, he not only defeated them, but he pushed them back. In fact, as, as we read in Hebrews, he slayed every one of them. Even when they went to Hovah, to the hiding place, he pursued them thus far. You can imagine, Abraham was feel, Abram was feeling pretty well that day, feeling pretty proud of himself. Here, he'd rescued his nephew Lot and his whole family. He'd rescued the women and the other families. He rescued the kings who still survived. He even recovered all of the possessions. So you can think to yourself where Abram must have been. Uh, just for a moment, think about where you are when you do really well, uh, if you uh, you play any, have played any sports and you succeed, or if you've done well in your business and, and you have something to be proud of, or when you think about your family, raising your family, and how proud you are when they succeed in school. Well, now imagine how Abram must have been feeling. And then something peculiar happens. All of a sudden we hear from this guy, this king from Salem, Melchizedek, the king of righteousness, so far, we hadn't heard from him. I encourage you to go back to Genesis 14 and, and sound out the words as you go, but read back through Genesis 14. We haven't heard from Salem before the, from the king of Salem before this point. We don't hear from him after this point. He shows up in the Psalms and then in Hebrews, but this random appearance. And here we have Abram, who's probably pretty proud of himself. And a couple things happen. First, he offers a tithe. Even though this king Melchizedek had not been present, he gives him a tithe, a 10% offering. Second, Melchizedek blesses him. You'd think Abram was the greater one. He'd just shown his military might, his 318 trained men succeeding. But instead, the blessing goes the other way. And listen again to this blessing here. Blessed be Abram by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Melchizedek points Abram not to himself, but instead to God. And this is something that is maybe, well, we might think, well, that's common in Scripture. But it's not so common in the world around us, is it? When we look at the measurement of success in our world today, when we look at the measurement of success by, even by armies, we talk about how they have done. How, what are their successes? When we talk about our successes, I was successful in raising my children to be good Christian people. We start with I. 
when we talk about our success in business and our, our promotions. Again, we're the center point. And you think about it, and that's the way the world measures success, isn't it? It measures it by what we have done, by the way that we have lived. And we call those who do not succeed losers. And think about it for a minute. Uh, many of you growing up played this game called dodgeball. I know it, for the kids that you guys aren't aware of that because they outlawed it in school, but maybe you remember dodgeball growing up. And you would line up. Everybody would line up, and then two captains would be chosen. And you'd have the first captain choose, the second captain, all the way down the line. And there was always one or two people left, weren't there? There was always one or two people left. Maybe you even have felt that yourself. And what do those people say? I, those captains say, I don't want them. It's not my turn. It's your turn. They're too slow. They don't throw the ball hard enough. And How does the world measure success? Just the way we do on dodgeball courts, right? Who's left? We call them the losers. We call them the ones that nobody wants. That's what pride leads to. Pride leads us to, to put other people as less than ourselves. Pride leads us to, 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 to count others as unworthy of our attention, unworthy of our time. Pride leads us to, to measure ourselves by what our outward actions are. And pride leads us to focus in on ourselves, on our own hearts. And even we see this all over the place in our world. Winston Churchill is attributed with this quote, although it's thought it was much earlier than him, but history is written by the victors. Even in history, we give it to the, those who succeed. And when you think about it, how often does pride play that part? How often does pride show up in our hearts? How often is it such a big part of our lives? It's not just about winning or losing. It's not just about how we do as parents. But even in our spiritual lives, we look at ourselves and we pat ourselves on the back. And by the way, I'm through the Bible for the 36th time, starting my 37th. Where are you at? We look at other Christians and we talk about our prayer lives and we pat ourselves on the back and we wonder, you know, so-and-so wasn't in church today. I wonder how their prior life is. We even, we, you know, we, we even look at other Christians and we think about, well, you know, I've done pretty good keeping God's law this week. But they sure haven't. And you think about how pride even worms its way into our spiritual lives as well. You know, it's interesting. C.S. Lewis, he, in Mere Christianity, he, like I said, he talks about pride actually quite a bit more than I'm going to bring up here. But he shares this quote about how insidious pride is how much it is a foundational part of all the rest of sin in our lives. The vice I'm talking of is pride or self-conceit. And the virtue opposite to it in Christian morals is called humility. According to Christian teachers, the essential vice, the utmost evil, is pride. Unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all that are mere flea bites in comparison. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. The complete anti-God state of mind. And isn't that what pride is? Because it puts us in the place of God. Isn't that what pride is? Because it replaces God in our lives as we're, again, we're us being the gods. And as often as we hear sermons on, the, on pride, as often as we talk about how pride continues to work, how many of us have been able to conquer it? Well, we would be bragging about it if we had, wouldn't we? How many of us truly know what humility is? You know, we, we, we thrive on this pride. And even as, uh, at times you, you hear it preached from Christian pulpits. We like this I statement. I surrendered myself to Jesus. I accepted Christ into my heart. And notice, who is the center point again? It is I, it is me. It's taking God out of the center of our lives. And that is where pride, what pride does. Pride replaces God as the center of our lives with ourselves. Pride replaces us as the center. Instead of caring for others, loving, loving others as God loves them, we love ourselves more. And we talk about it as though it's a good thing. 
We pat ourselves on the back. And it, don't get me wrong, it's good to be, to be bold about being in God's Word. It's good to be bold about being in prayer, encouraging one another. But when we do that, simply to kind of see where everyone else is at, compare ourselves to everyone else, we're not doing it for the right purpose. We're not doing it for God. We're doing it for ourselves. And the devil, he likes to use those things. That's why we need to constantly be on guard because the devil will constantly use that pride in our hearts, that pride to divide us from one another and divide us from God. He'll constantly use that pride to, to put ourselves first and come to God with this attitude of deserving expectation. God, you owe me this. God, I deserve this. Think about how Lewis said it. Unchastity, anger, drunkenness all come from pride. And, and the list goes on. How often is our anger, sinful anger, because we allow it to be ruled by what someone else did to us, what someone else should have done, and what they owe us. He uses this example of drunkenness. What is drunkenness but giving into our own desires, into our own whims, and any of those other sins? And you think about that as you go down that list. And I encourage you to think about your own life. When you think about the sins in your own heart, how many of them start with pride? What you feel you're owed, what you feel you deserve. In truth, we deserve nothing but eternal death and punishment. But instead, God has given us everything. In Romans chapter 5, I, I, it's so beautiful the way that Paul puts this. While we were yet sinners, for while we were still weak, at the right hand, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still full of our sinfulness, poor, miserable sinners, full of pride, full of envy, full of boasting, Christ died for us. Christ died for you and he died for me. While we yet did not deserve it. Not, we could not reach a hand to him. We could not speak a word to him. We could not even give an assent of our mind to him. And yet he died for us. He humbled himself. Although he could have called down a legion of angels to defend himself, he allowed himself to be taken to trial, imprisoned and tortured. Although he could have, could have stopped all the events of crucifixion, he allowed himself to be hung on the tree, to be humbled, to be stricken and smitten and afflicted, to be stripped down and mocked. And he did that for us. He could have stopped it, any time, but he chose not to. He chose to humble himself, and is there anything more humbling for us to hear than to know God's mercy for us? To know that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we still did not deserve it, Christ died for us. And even still, he has given his life so that each day we might know his love and mercy is new. So that each day we might again be humbled in that presence of God. Humbled before Him. Humbled to know that all we have, the gifts and abilities, are gifts from Him. Humbled to know that the joys that we celebrate are gifts from Him. Humbled to know that we need Him. And we need His Spirit to walk with us each day. You know, I, I, I don't know if you caught this, but I couldn't help but see it. And maybe it's just my Lutheran eyes, but I want to take you back to Genesis 14. There's just this verse, it's a really short verse, 14 verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high. Like I said, I don't know if it's just my Lutheran eyes, but I don't think so because uh, the author of Hebrews go, takes this same step. But here, clearly, Melchizedek, the king of righteousness, is, is that pre-incarnate Christ, that Christ who came to be among the people before he came as a baby in Bethlehem. And he offers this bread and wine. I can't help but make that connection to the provisions God gives us in the Lord's Supper. To the nurturing of our faith, the strengthening of our faith He gives us. Each time we receive that bread and wine, kneeling before His altar. When we kneel, we humble ourselves. We confess our sins. And He gives us the greatest gift of all. His very own body and blood for our forgiveness. What a truly humbling thing, experience worship is. As we receive those provisions of God. As we come to our Lord and we see 
his continued work in our lives, the continued ways that he has not given up on us, but continues to love us and care for us. As you think about pride and humility, as you think about the way that sometimes pride has allowed to itself to reign in your hearts, I, I encourage you to also think about the way that Christ put aside any pride and humbled himself for our sake to know that he would give all so that we would one day be able to join him in the victory feast, which has no end. May you each day celebrate being the sons and daughters of God. And instead of boasting in yourselves, boast in the Lord. Boast in the Lord who has conquered all. Boast in the Lord who is the victor. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, we pray that you would forgive us for those times when pride rules in our hearts, when self-conceit and self-centeredness take control of us, when, when we fall into our temptations and fall into our desires instead of humbling ourselves and following your word and your will. We thank you, Lord, that you have sent your son Jesus to humble himself for us, that he has given his life for us, that he has given his life that we might have eternal life. We pray that each day, that we would trust in his promise and trust in that hope that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. But Lord, help us also to know that the celebration is yet to come, that he did not remain in that tomb, that he did not remain dead, but that he get conquered death, that he declared victory, and that one day we will join him in that victory feast which shall have no end. May you bless us now and forevermore. In Jesus' name. Amen.